Hello, welcome to Out Loud LGBTQI experiences, music experiences in our industry. My name is Sunny Sumter. I'm executive director of the DC Jazz Festival, and we're delighted to bring this panel discussion for you today. And now I would like to introduce our amazing partners from the Embassy of Sweden and Finland, cultural counselors, Suvi Yavala Hagström and Helen Larson Passet. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Helene Larsson Possett, and I'm the culture counselor at the Embassy of Sweden in Washington, DC. Warm thanks to our partners, DC Jazz Festival, the corner at Whitman Walker, the Human Rights Campaign Foundation, and all others that have helped us to promote this event. Hello, my name is Suvi Järvela Hagström, and I am the cultural counselor at the Embassy of Finland in Washington, D.C. Thank you also to all our wonderful panelists and moderator for being available today. It is great to have you here to share your experiences as LGBTQI artists and your views about what needs to be done to ensure equal opportunities for everyone in the music industry and beyond. We are very happy Sara and Tuve are participating today from Finland and Sweden. We are discussing a very important topic today. Homosexuality is still criminalized in more than 70 countries. And the daily lives of sexual and gender minorities are still marked by bias and discrimination all over the world. While much have improved during the past decades, we still have a lot of work to do to improve attitudes, strengthen legislation and end harmful practices. No one should be attacked, lose their jobs or otherwise be discriminated because of who they love, what they wear and how they define their sexual and gender identity. The first LGBTQI rights organization was founded in Sweden around 70 years ago and in Finland around 50 years ago. Much has changed since then. Finland's current foreign minister is our first openly gay foreign minister and our current prime minister was raised by a same-sex couple. Today, Finns and Swedes can change their legal gender on the basis of self-determination and without having to undergo mandatory sterilization. Same-sex couples can marry and adopt and have access to fertility treatments. Furthermore, the equality legislation in both Finland and Sweden prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity and gender expression. We continue to work to make sure that individuals that identify as LGBTQI can exercise their rights and live their lives without discrimination. Sweden is therefore proud to co-host World Pride 2021 to celebrate equality, arts and human rights. Sweden and Finland also promote LGBTQI rights through our international cooperation in our bilateral relations with the European Union, United Nations, Equal Rights Coalition, Pride events around the world and with partners such as the Human Rights Campaign Foundation here in DC. If Finland is elected for UN Human Rights Council later this year, we would like to work together to make human rights more of a reality for everyone. We need cooperation to help people in the most vulnerable situations during and after a global pandemic more than ever. We also welcome the active stance taken by the Biden administration on advancing the rights of LGBTQI persons. Sexual orientation should not affect the person's ability to succeed in politics, diplomacy, arts and culture or any other sector. To this end, we're very much looking forward to hearing the views of today's panelists. Once again, thank you for joining and please enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Suvi and Helene. That was wonderful. Great start to this conversation. And now I'd like to introduce our sponsor for this event, Whitman Walker Health. Let's welcome Ruth Nowak from the corner at Whitman Walker. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to our loud LGBTQI experiences in the music industry. My name is Ruth Nowak, and as the executive director of the Corn at Whitman Walker, a vibrant new cultural center in DC, I'm super thrilled that we're sponsoring this event. Embedded in an LGBTQ and HIV focused healthcare institution that has done vital work more than 40 years, the corner at Whitman Walker brings art, health, and education together to address issues of social justice and equality. So Out Loud is right up our alley. If you want to find out more about us, look us up at thecornerdc.com or visit us at the corner of 14th and R Street. We have ex an exhibition about the history of Whitman Walker and on a, right now and on April 30th, we are opening Stay Alive, to life, a show about the resilience in times of COVID. And now it's my pleasure, very big pleasure, to introduce the fabulous moderator of Out Loud, John Murph. Welcome everyone, hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I'm so excited to be moderating this panel. Um, excited about the topic as well as the panelists themselves. They all bring something unique uh, to the table. Um, and before we look at a sizzle reel, I just want to encourage everyone out there who's uh, watching this panel to tweet out the panel, um, hashtag out loud LGBTQI. Uh, just tweet it out, let everyone know that we're having this panel and hopefully this panel is a launching pad for further discussions, further collaborations, you know, just bigger and brighter things all together. I would echo that um, is just being able to be completely yourself. And I, I, I'll, I'll say, I'm not sure how old everybody is, but I think I might be the oldest person on this panel. Uh, oh, come on, Leah. 62. Okay, you got me beat. I knew I had to beat, that's why I was so on it. So, uh, but I, you know, I, I, I never, I didn't start out my career as an out performer. I did it way later. I think I was uh, 40 when I uh, formally came out publicly. So I kind of had um, one, one foot in the old model, which was kind of blending in and one foot in the new model. Uh, and the difference between just how comfortable I became after I came out publicly where there was no secrets anymore. Mm -hmm. It was just a world of difference. It made my, it made everything better. It made my art better. It made my life better. Just, mm -hmm. it was a, a real turning point. Yeah, I would, I would definitely echo that as well. I think one of the things that I've found, cause I came out publicly, it hasn't been long. I think it's been two years, three years now. Um, and I found that because you know you grow up and you're not like the norm or like what what is considered regular or standard um there's sort of a, an inevitable an inevitable journey of like asking yourself questions and and self-discovery in that and i found that like through having a practice of that with my sexuality it's easier to do that in music now like i feel like the boundaries of genre seem like nothing when like the boundaries of like actual lived life out in the world seem so much more like you know, dire. So once you like pass that boundary, like the music stuff is like. Psh. Now I have a complete opposite uh, mm. situation than uh, because I've always been out. Mm. I've never not been in the closet. Um, I've never not been a performer. So since 1982, I've made my living performing as an openly uh, as a as a dyke basically, mm. and. Uh, um, and in fact, it was illegal to be queer in almost every state of the union at that time. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had the advantage of traveling all over the world with this and watching the world change. And that's why I'm absolutely, I mean, like when, now this is fewer and farther between now, but when I first started 20 years ago in, in jazz, people had only heard me like on the radio, you know what I mean? because people actually listen to the radio. So people had only heard me on the radio, they'd buy a ticket to come see my show. And then when I would walk onto the, I could see it as I walked through the audience, this stiffening of people in the audience and this look like, well, what's that dyke gonna do? You know, and then I, I would start with welcome to my party. That's off my first record. And the, with basically this attitude, 
that this is what this dyke's going to do. <laughs> and I would win them over by one song. But see, I'm curious to s- listen to like Toba and Sarah and the, the younger generation and how much it's changed now. So I'm talking about 20 years ago. You know, I'd love to know what it's like for them. Mm, yeah, like I feel it like, because I also like recently kind of recently came out. But to me, it almost wasn't like a coming out like it was just me going with my girlfriend to a thing and all of a sudden I was queer and like out in the public eye um so it's been more like uh I don't know I never felt really like I was in the closet because I always just really felt like myself like a person and um but there's been this shift before and after like the public seeing me perceiving me as yeah, oh, yeah, you know, it's weird. I, 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 can you hear me, everybody? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I went uh, when I was like, I think I was 26. I have no idea, 28, something like this. And I was making out with my boyfriend. You know, he's like, oh my God, you finally came out. I was like, you all knew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, right? Like, what? Like somehow this event, I was at a wedding, we're making out, I'm making out with my boyfriend and there's photos because there was a photog there and you know, they were like, click, click, click. And like, you finally came out. And I was like, really? I mean, what does that even mean? You know, what? Wow. wow. <laughs> Sarah, uh, let's yeah. hear from you. Yeah, so yeah, going back to the first question, um, for me, I agree with everybody. Like, I feel like, after coming out I kind of felt more freedom to be weird and different and express myself more freely I felt Mm -hmm. like I wasn't in a box anymore like I didn't have to behave in a certain way I was just able to do whatever I wanted and that was great and helped with my art and my music so much Mm -hmm. and well yeah and when I came out I was actually I was like publicly known as a straight girl because I used to date a, a man and and he was also a singer in Finland so we were like both of us were out like together like um as a couple and when I came out with my wife uh, well then my girlfriend I was of course like nervous about it because people saw me as this really cute girly straight girl like singing with her beautiful voice and then suddenly I shaved my hair and came out with my girlfriend and people were like what like what, like they honestly like lost their minds they were like no 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 something is wrong here like how come she is gay now like what like I really loved it I love wow. to shock I, I love to shock people I was like yeah I can look straight and still be uh, like 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 girls like so yeah it, it was but but I I didn't lose any fans everybody supported me I didn't really get any negative comments the only mm-hmm. negative thing was a journalist calling me immediately when I posted on Facebook that I had a girlfriend a journalist called me saying is this a joke or like is this a real thing and I was like yeah it's a real thing but that was the only negative thing really everybody actually was quite like surprised but but happy for me so yeah Oh, wow. That kind of taps into another question that I want to follow mm. on is the whole audience, because I remember when I wrote this piece in Jazz Times and several year old um, Dave, Theo and Andrew was a part of it about um, how queer people in the jazz field uh, touch upon sexual orientation. And I remember getting more pushback from the managers. Oh my goodness, you're gonna write this and they're gonna lose the audience. So talk a bit about that because we have this, on one hand, we get this message that is uh, that is freeing and you get to explore more arts and you know it just kind of creates more bandwidth. Uh, and then you have these managers and record companies execs saying you're going to lose your fan base. So. The question is, talk a bit about how uh, some of y'all coming out publicly in your all's career, how did it shift your uh, audience base? Uh, Dave, you said you were 40 when you came out publicly during your mm-hmm. career. What did they do to your audience? I, I'll just back up a little bit, <clears throat> pardon me, and just say that I never planned to come out. I was mm-hmm. convinced that that would never happen. Mm-hmm. as a younger artist. Uh, I started making records in 1990. 
And uh, it just was not a possibility. But one mm. time uh, I had a, a journalist friend who was writing for a gay magazine and I had a record coming out. Uh, this was in 2003. And he said, I'd like to, to interview you for it. And I said, well, I just, I'm not going to come out. I don't want to talk about being gay. He said, oh, no, no, this is fine. We're just going to focus on the album. And then he wrote the story, turned it into his editors, and the editors were new and said, we know this guy's gay. Because I, I never really sort of was completely in the closet. People knew that I was gay. I just was not uh, publicly out. And so he, they said, uh, you have to ask him because we know that he's gay. You're going to have to ask him about it. Otherwise, we can't print this. So my friend sheepishly came to me and said, um, I'm really sorry, but I have to either ask you about your, you being gay or we can't run the story. And I, all of a sudden, I noticed something inside of me was like, maybe I can come out. Maybe this is not such a horrible thing. It was the first time it dawned on me. And I thank this guy for, for uh, all this time for, for opening that channel in me. In the end, I, I decided to come out, but I used a different magazine. I went, uh, I did it in the Advocate, which was at the time it felt like the right um, outlet to do it. And um, so it's like you build this huge mountain of fear up, and that's what you know, and you feel like it's completely unscalable. And then something happens, and all of a sudden you just start climbing that mountain. And I got to the other side, this thing came out, I got to the other side, there was no mountain. It was all a figment of my own imagination. Everything, like I worried so much about fans and, and uh, ticket sales and record album sales, etc. Nothing materialized. Uh, there were no changes other than everything got better because I was better inside. So it was a really interesting uh, lesson to learn to face. And I think like we were talking a little bit about it before. Like once you can, once you do that, once you face that massive fear and get on the other side of it, it's like you can do anything. So it was a really pivotal moment in my life. I'll never uh, forget it. I thank that one journalist <laughs> for opening the channel for me. Yeah, I, I, I was outed through uh, an article, and it's a little bit similar, but I had no control over it. And there was a review, and it just claimed that I was gay. It must have been obvious. So um, there it was. Like, it, here's this gay artist. I did not consent to that. And nothing happened. Nobody cared. Nothing happened. My life wasn't over. My career wasn't over. I didn't have much of a career anyway. But so it wasn't really that big a deal that I had made out in my head to be and this, uh, you know, fire that's going to consume everything and I'm going to it's going to all be over. And and um, I always wonder if there are people that are not coming to my concerts because I'm gay, because it, there might be some. And you know what? I don't want them at my concert. So it's a good it's a good synergy if the, if those people stay away and uh that's all i have to say after that article was out and you know it was just such a relief i didn't have to you know tiptoe around it or do this or do that or say this or that so yes thank you to the press <laughs> i just I, i'd like to thank the press Great. Uh, anyone else yeah, but you, you know the whole story about george michael right everybody yeah exactly like he did you know lose some at least he lost some support from the record industry, I think. Correct. The way they portrayed him um, as a, not only as a pop singer, but as a straight pop singer. Like, it's amazing that people thought that he was straight. I'm like- Who thought that? All right. I, <laughs> one of my friends used to say, don't you have to be in to come out? Like, I <laughs> love George Michael. Don't get me wrong. I love George Michael. But when I first saw him, it's like, right. who's convincing themselves that this is a straight man? But he right. had that pressure. And that pressure was real. And we have to also acknowledge intersectionality. Um, um, like, um, Michael, you know, it, it could be very different from for people of color and ethnicities. Uh, Michael, what was your story uh, in terms of um, coming out? Yeah, um, for me, I, I think it's interesting because I'm bisexual. And so mm -hmm. like there, the optics of that can be kind of murky. Mm -hmm. because, like, Always. Yeah, because it feels like you either, ha you have to be performative to someone. And if you're mm -hmm. not, you're not honoring all of yourself. So then you have to be, like you have to be performative to someone else, right? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, and I've, I've, I've experienced it from both sides. I've experienced it from like straight friends and from gay friends who like they all, you know, with with by men, they think you're in denial and you're actually gay and you're 
claiming to be bi, which like a lot of people do that. So like, I get it, but that's not the case for me. And then for bi women, they think that they're just going through a phase and they're really straight. Um, and so for me, that was interesting because my journey coming up, like it was both like, I could sort of pass for straight in the sense that I was attracted to women, but it also felt performative at the same time. Like I felt like I was over, over performing my attraction to women because I thought I had to do it extra so that they wouldn't see that I was also attracted to men. Mm -hmm. um, and when it came to coming out, like, I mean, I've been out to friends, mm -hmm. you know, for like coming up on a decade now, but I didn't come out like publicly on like social media until a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and my main worry for that was like my fellow like people on the bandstand, like are mm -hmm. they, is the bass player that I call for this gig going to be weird about it? Mm -hmm. um, and like, I think in the black community, male homosexuality specifically is like still big time taboo mm -hmm. and, and jazz is black music. And, mm -hmm. you know, even though a lot of non-black people play it, there's still a lot of those seeds in there. And so I was sort of doubly worried about it. I was like, who do I have to like, do I have to be hyper vigilant now? Like I came mm -hmm. up my whole life being hyper vigilant about everything. Like now do I have to be like extra super hyper vigilant about everything? Um, and finally I realized it was the same thing as, as like Theo said, when I, when I came out, it was like, everything was fine. Like mm -hmm. there were, there were a couple like little, you know, Instagram trolls that said things, but like for the most part, it was totally fine. And I feel like now other people have felt a bit more comfortable, like expressing things to me about themselves mm -hmm. because of that, because of that visibility. I think like, um, like male by like by men it's like a weirdly invisible thing mm -hmm. um so like i don't know i i i i would have liked to have someone like that when i was coming up so i guess if i can be that for someone yeah. like cool wow that kind of and i want to tap into what you just said because that's one of the questions um having like gay low stars um like people who you saw like you as an LGBTQ person. Um, and as a black gay man, I'm still learning like low stars. I was watching this documentary on PBS, Mr. Soul. And the host was this guy named Ellis Hazlip from Washington DC, black guy. And uh, Soul was this, um, I think it was the first African-American um, variety show. And they brought everyone, they had the last poets, they had Sonia Sanchez, they had Lee Morgan, Stephen Wonder, and this host was a black gay man. Mm. I love the fact that he not only he stood in his power, like when he had, um, uh, I think Louis Farrakhan. Uh, anyway, uh, he actually asked him, was like, let's talk about the stance of the Nation of Islam with the gay community, which was very powerful. This was 1970. Um, so my point is, like, did you all grow up with um, gay idols who say, you know what, I might, I can see myself, I can see a light at the tunnel where I can be uh, a gay person in this creative world and really stand in that power. Um, does anyone want to tap into that? Let's, uh, like, Sarah or Tova, did y'all have any of those people? Well... Not really. I mean, I liked Madonna, but and she is a gay icon. But mm. really, when I grew up, I didn't really know that I was gay. I didn't even know that it existed in a way. Like I'm from a very small town in Finland, and I just didn't see any lesbians or gays around me. Even in high school, I was a bit like I didn't really know about it that much, to be honest. I just knew that I kind of was attracted to girls, but I didn't really know that was it really serious? I wasn't sure about it. Um, mm. But I was lucky when I was 19, I got to do some musical theater. And I, I think that was the first time when I actually got friends that were gay, mm. like in musical theater community, there's so many gays and, and the director of the musical was also gay. And I think that was when my eyes kind of opened and I was like, ah, oh, there is this community, they go to gay bars and, 
I would always go with them and be like, oh my God, like the music and everything, like that kind of opened my eyes. And I realized that, yeah, that's my world. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What about Tov? Tov, you want to speak? Um, yeah, like I, I just feel like growing up, I, there's there was definitely uh, a lack of queer female pop musicians to look up to. Like I can't come up with any, like nobody comes to mind. And yeah, as you I said, like you were, I was so drawn to these like icons like Madonna because watching Blonde Ambition, that like tour, it felt so gay and nice and like open, but she wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm so glad that today there are actually like artists like Janelle Monae, um, mm -hmm. and, like Hailey Kiyoko that, that are so openly gay and bi and it's, it's just, um, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad for people. Uh, growing up now, who had people like that? Okay. Um, does anyone else want to? Uh... Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I'd love to. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Theo. Go, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. All right. No, I just wanted to say that um, when I grew up, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I was born in 1958. And again, when I came out uh, in the 70s, it was illegal to be queer in every state of the, of the union. Um, and there has very recently been a lot more representation of lesbians that mm -hmm. we are actually a part of the narrative. Now, see, that's where it becomes, that's where I start to go a little ape shit here uh, because even the music industry, you know, they're, they're so controlling. And whenever we see a narration that has anything to do with us dykes, um, it's usually written by a man, it's directed by a man, and mm -hmm. uh, they have a straight girl player. Mm -hmm. And we get erased from our narrative, but we are starting to stand tall about that. So when I say, did I, was there a role model anywhere? No, I actually think I might be it. I might be the only butch in the music industry. Mm. <laughs> Who's out, out yeah. in front and anyway. I'm <laughs> cer certain there's engineers and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. producers, but in terms of me, because that it's a whole different... I'm really, the, my butch pride is very strong because mm -hmm. like queenie gay men, we are ostracized very much from our, from society, even within our own fucking community, you mm -hmm. know, queer, you know, and how many times have I been asked recently, it used to all be before, why do you want to be a man? Now it's, why don't you want to transition? It's like, because I'm a fucking butch. It's who I am and I struggle <laughs> all of this being, and there's a whole fucking a lot of us out there we all just left you bitches because you treat us like this. You know? <laughs> right. Now we live in the woods and that raise alpacas. So <laughs> if you welcomed us just a little bit once in a while, you probably see more of us. But even that's starting to change. And I mean, I think all of us who are, are out, no matter whether it was from the beginning or when we were 40 or are, are young people that are standing tall, you know, as we run out of fucks to give, we are seeing ourselves actually make a statement a point an actual change now that and that's amazing to me and i can look around in the industry now and see that you know so that's a that's a progress we've made yeah i had a, a book when i uh, was in my 20s that had for for each day of the year it had one gay artist from the, from the ages and i loved that book mm -hmm. because it was high art pop art a painting literature it had everything um, and it was just comforting for me to leaf through that and see, uh, you know, all all fields of the art, because what what we're usually fed is sort of the extreme edges of it. And they're cart cartoonized and controlled, as you said, you know, or, or manipulated by uh, the wrong people and not owned by the, you know, the people that that are that. For me, my biggest idol, and this is kind of strange, was John Cage and Merce Cunningham. And I actually had the great pleasure of meeting both of them and having a bit of time with them together uh, because it wasn't it wasn't an issue for them to have it be out. It was just there, you know, it was just there. They were extremely sweet and tender with each other, but the work itself uh, was not about that. And I found that really extremely inspiring at the time. And I, I, I was so moved by the fact that it was just it was just there. It was completely grounded that they were a couple it, and they were in love and there was, that's it. There was no need uh, to talk about it in public. And I know this might seem a little bit um, 
sort of like they're repressing it and maybe they were but the fact that they existed and they didn't change the narrative they didn't hide it that uh, was extremely inspiring to me those people are like angels the yeah. when you find them like i remember a, a, a period of, of time where i was just so craving any little bit of like you're okay any little bit i remember there was a movie this is really showing my age but there was a movie that came out called making love if you remember that in the 80s and it was like gay characters in a in a movie like real gay characters in a movie and i was like i can't believe this that was like way in the beginning and also uh, john i also think it's important to to it's all seriously like the, the um some of the things that sir and, and uh tova were talking about which is the how this has all evolved so beautifully as time has gone on. But timing is a really interesting piece of this whole thing. I graduated in high, uh, high school in 1981 at the onset of HIV and AIDS. And it just was like, as if it wasn't bad enough to be gay, then you've got this whole layer on top of that. Yep. I remember very vividly just like, I'm getting out of here. I'm just like pulling back. I'm not going to be on the front lines of this because I don't want to die. And here I was just coming of age and wanting to have sex and, you know, uh, explore that side of myself. And it was just not possible because I, I just didn't, I was too afraid. So I think that has a lot to do with it. The timing that we all come up in has a lot to do with our experience, which is why I'm so thrilled that younger artists that we have represented here are having a very different experience than say Leah and, and I had. And we had it better than the, the generation before. We're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Exactly. All of us. Yes. All of us, you know. Um, um, the, um, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I grew up um, as a teen in the eighties, uh, during the eighties. And I do remember being extremely horny and extremely scared of sex and how um, it's almost similar to the pandemic in which you, I felt like I'm just trapped into my body and you're afraid to move and you know um, the, the impact it has on your soul and your mental state where you you're afraid to even touch someone. Um, in terms of and this is more of a conversation for um, Michael, Theo, and Dave, uh, did y'all have any managers, uh, and also um, Andrew D'Angelo, if he's still there, I can't see him on, on the screen. Did you all have any managers who tried to suppress your art in terms of how you address your sexual orientation? I'm thinking about you, Dave, I'm looking at the video and I'm uh, of Dr. Norm, and I'm seeing the rainbow colors back there and it looks very intentional. Uh, did anyone tell you, oh, you can't have that. You need the American flag. Um, what was some what that makes me so proud of that? I didn't even know that that existed <laughs> until I saw it there because I hadn't seen that video. Um, that is my lighting designer. We had mm -hmm. a live stream that on for uh, Valentine's weekend that that, that was pulled from and um, our lighting designer, who I just said, you know, just take care of all the visuals and stuff like that. I, you know, I trust him so much for so many years. And he did that on his own. He's not gay, but he knows that I am. And he's like, I've already given him the sort of the go ahead to just like explore that, you know, wherever mm -hmm. you feel it's, it's appropriate. Now that to me is progress. Yeah. That in this situation, I didn't even know about it. And he did it on his own. He's not even gay. And he put it in, it wasn't for the whole song, but he put that element in there just to support me and also to further advance. And I, I don't wear my gayness on the, on the very front. I mean, people know I've been out for a long time now. People know, but I don't really talk about it that much, but it's, it's there. And I love being able to be subtle about it in, in, in that particular way. And I, um, my first manager, just to talk about the manager, my first manager was very uncomfortable with me coming out, which uh, didn't happen uh, when she was my manager. The next manager I had was also the manager of uh, Melissa Etheridge mm. and had, had that whole experience before me. So when it came time for me to come out, uh, he was like, yeah, let's do it. So it was, it was a very easy thing. Once I made the decision that that was going to happen, it, it all, all the pieces really quite easily fit together. And now 
our organization, um, I mean, we have a little small little camp, but um, everybody's on the same page. That I don't have to say anything. I don't have to tell anybody to do anything. They just do it, and they know that it's their 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 support is appreciated and recognized. And everybody in their own elements. It's not just about gay. Whatever it is, we have a very big tent philosophy for being in a very small tent. <laughs> Um, anyone else want to add to that discussion? Um, well, I, you know, my, my, the stuff I make is so weird and off the mainstream already most of the time that that normally doesn't apply to me. I mean, nobody, you know, the, the people that I work with know who I am. They've known uh, who I am for a long time and there is just no hiding. And they've they come to me because of my work and how weird and quirky it can be or how unex unpredictable it is sometimes and that's the kind of people i attract and so nobody's ever said could you be less gay except for myself perhaps mm. i'm sometimes mm. my worst enemy um but no nobody else has has really tried to shape that uh that i know of okay. yeah I, I was actually what you said just now theo except for like yourself i was gonna say like my team has been amazing like there's literally never been any sort of negativity or like trying to you know tamp anything down um it's all been very positive in fact like you know they they asked me like am i comfortable with them exploring opportunities related you know what i mean like and i and looking back at being a kid that is literally like unimagined like unimaginable that someone that i work with would ask me like are you comfortable if we look for opportunities re related to your sexual orientation like that sounds absurd <laughs> and so uh yeah it's been really awesome and in fact having people that are so supportive has sort of helped me in my own journey of like self-acceptance so i'm oh, wow. thankful for that. so they answer your grinder messages also yeah they did yeah that's actually how i found found <laughs> them all great great it's good okay so i have everyone's grinder uh what's the <laughs> uh, what is the female? Wanna, what's the, what's the lesbian that, uh, equivalent? I want to invent what that you, app for lesbians, and I'm just going to call it Grind Her. Ah! Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> trademark, yeah. trademark, 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 trademark. All right, mine, mine. Right. <laughs> I'm glad that we're talking about the safe space because it brings me to another issue. Um, I think most of us are based in for the. Uh, for the sake of a, uh, lack of a better word, like safer spaces to be queer in. I'm in Washington, D.C. Some of you are in New York. Some of you are in P-Town in which, you know, we don't have to look over our shoulders as we would in my, uh, I grew up in Mississippi. And yeah, that's a whole other, you know. I grew up in St. Louis. Bag of shit. Yeah. But when you, but when you take, when you're taking your act on the road, have you ever, had experiences and we did not feel safe in certain spaces. Um, I think I forget it was Sara or uh, Toby mentioned about going to Lebanon and what that was like. Can one of y'all tap into what that was like when you're you have a tour manager who's like, okay, now you're in Saudi Arabia and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> mm, yeah, that was me. Uh, I had a show in Lebanon at a big university, and I think it wasn't until we were about to leave. They told us that, oh, like, um, uh, like if you only like hold hands with somebody else on the street, they can basically, somebody can see that, call the police and you're screwed. Like, cause it's illegal there. And the thought never crossed my mind before that it can be like that. That was such an eye opener to me. And um, yeah, it's, it's so scary that, that it's dangerous to 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 be queer in certain places and 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 like we were walking around like having the best time like eating good food everything seemed like it's it's a normal place like it seems exactly like here but it's illegal to be me it's ugh. Uh, yeah i've played in in um in egypt um in alexandria and in cairo and of course you have to be super careful um, I think the most, in a lot of uh, countries, you have to be careful not to say that you're gay, but the behavior itself, I mean, you see men walking around holding hands or uh, being arm in arm in a lot of Muslim countries. Uh, there's a lot of tenderness between men, 
but uh, the, the declamation or declaration of uh, being gay is, is what gets you into trouble. And of course, kissing or, you know, public affection in that way would be out of the, out of the, uh, completely not possible. Um, I've been to Saudi where, um, where I'm looking at the, at the, the plaza where people are beheaded or getting their hands cut off. Of course, there was no spectacle there. Meanwhile, in this meeting that I'm having, I'm being cruised by, by you know, a, a, a guy who's supposedly straight. I mean, the whole thing is so complicated and so convoluted that um, you just best stay out of prison, is all I have to say, so you can come back <laughs> for, mm -hmm. for now. There's no need for me to be the one who is being, you know, who is holding up the flag and being locked up for seven years. I just don't need that right now. Mm -hmm. I'm busy with other stuff. There is the question though is, uh, and this has happened to me, is if you get an offer to play a country that has terrible, um, uh, a terrible history of, uh, of queer rights, do you go? Do you, uh, it's like the same questions that happens, you know, do you do you take a stand and go and help in the change, or do you do you say no? I'm not going because they they don't they don't see me. No, I think you should go. You should not. You should absolutely go. You don't have to. Uh, you you bring what you have, and then people will. They know that you're gay. I mean, they know through the internet. They know through other means that you are gay, and the fact that you were there, I think, is a good thing. Is better than not. I think. Yeah, and 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 it, I just think of all the little queer kids that like see that, and even you know seeing something once when you're, you know, eight years old, can change the rest of your life. And and like I remember when uh, Brokeback Mountain came out. I remember because I for a long time I I always knew that I was attracted to to boys and girls growing up. But I, and I also always knew because kids are perceptive. I also knew that it was OK to be attracted to girls and it wasn't OK to be attracted to boys. And I didn't know anyone else who was into guys. And, you know, only the only time I ever saw men into men portrayed in media, it was always like something bad. Um, and so I thought I was like the only person in the world who had those feelings. And then when that movie came out, I remember like when I saw the commercial, my heart like it was like this crazy moment of just realization and opening. And then suddenly, like, I can't I can't show that I'm reacting to this, too. There's so many inner narratives that go on. But just the fact that something like that could exist was enough to to reassure me that I wasn't alone. Um, and like, obviously, coming out is a really great freeing experience if you live in a place where it's safe. But I think like something that we as a community need to be careful of is closet shaming, because a lot of people like literally need to be in the closet in order to stay alive um and but i also think like 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 you're saying dave and theo that like these opportunities to give like 15 percent of an inkling to someone who may be in the closet by them seeing you i think is always worth it because you never know what could change someone's life anyone else want to ask we do need to like shift the um, conversation uh, to uh, Q&A. But I also, uh, before we do that, I just want to briefly ask, um, how have you, or if you use your platform to kind of shed light on the plight of gay people, queer people around the world? Um, uh, I know some people, I'm just thinking about um, uh, some of y'all's uh, video presentations, um, Sarah, uh, Dance Like Nobody's Watching. You know, that's a powerful video and it's a beautiful mm -hmm. video, even coming from somewhere in which um, gay rights are more progressive. Could you talk a bit about, you know, you're based in Finland where, you know, it's more progressive, but you still felt the need to address that struggle in that video. Could you talk a bit about that? Sounds like nobody's watching is, sorry, you froze for a while, but yeah, yeah. about the video. Yeah, um, Dance Like Nobody's Watching was all about uh, telling a story of a transgender ballerina. So um, so in the video, we actually got a real 
transgender ballerina dancing and it was her first time ever dancing like openly and professionally after her transformation so she was like crying in the video dancing her her dance and 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 the video was done together with the UK transgender organization the mermaids and it honestly the the feedback and it was mind blowing i felt like there was a need for that video and when the kids watched it in the uk everywhere like um i had some meet and greets with them so um even though i'm from finland i i live in london at the moment and um so i did some meet and greets with 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 the kids and and i, I can't even describe how it was like there isn't that many like transgender stories told in in pop music actually so the video got such good feedback and yeah i remember when me and my team watched it for the first time when we got the video from the editor we were all crying like oh my god like it's such a beautiful story and i'm so glad i got to use my art and my music to to make that video yeah uh Toba, talk about about your like sway is another um it touches upon struggle of being someone uh, being themselves and in this whole reframe of uh getting up when you're knocked down again and you see you know the skateboarder and you see him in this dance place and he's um dancing with this guy um yeah so like the whole the whole video um i i just wanted to tell uh, a story uh that felt real and intimate and it's a rom like because like the video starts out with these guys like hanging skateboarding and like yeah and as the night progresses they like end up in um an apartment and they kiss and it's like a whole like it's like a whole like you know like these like magical nights that you only had when you were like a teenager that where you're like in a bubble and it's like oh this is like happening right here i just wanted to like tell something that felt relatable and real and not like too on the nose and not like now i'm gonna make this statement i just wanted it to be like a real heartfelt mm -hmm. story that i related to and i also thought it was a really like um like interesting thing to have it be two guys skating like just finding two two actors who mm -hmm. could skate for real because they're really really good that's like their life um just finding two guys who could skate who were willing to do that scene was we almost had to cancel it because we couldn't find it um because and what we also noticed that was also really interesting like finding girls who could skate um who wanted to do a scene like that simple because there's a lot of queer women skating because they're already sort of like outside the norm but guys because it's not that accepted in that community so it was a very interesting experience um and very like it was a heart project that that video theo i want to talk to um and i've i've, I've loved this song and i and we never had a conversation i don't think um outside of this panel another holiday every time i hear that song it reminds me of you know, me before really coming out yeah. with my family, going home, and you're so afraid to talk about anything related to you and your sexuality that you're yeah. talking about the weather. Uh, yeah. Am I projecting that onto the song? Or No, 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 the song, I wrote the song in, in a weird response to the Pulse nightclub shooting, and I usually I, I don't, you know, deal with direct gay subject matters, but this just, I, it just came out. and. It was this idea that we're all very safe and cozy in our bubble with our friends and all our super queer people and everything is uh, fantastic. And then you have to go home. And this was true for me as well. When my mom said, well, just don't say anything. Just don't say anything mm. to the neighbors. Just don't, you know, they don't have to know that. And it wasn't mean or it wasn't, she just, she just, she was the one that's in that town and has to deal with it when I'm gone. I'm like, I'm married to a black man. Yay. Woohoo. And then I <laughs> like, what what just happened <laughs> so, um, so it was really this weird dichotomy between uh you know living this unbelievably fantastic life and then coming home and just reducing myself again to this you know person and 
sort of also to you know what Michael said earlier, just all this, all this editing and n n narrating, and so it's all fine and dandy, you know. But when you get to your family, and that's really when you're the loneliest. Sometimes mm. that's when you feel like I have nobody. <laughs> I'm just by myself once again. It's a very sad feeling, and so that's why I wrote this very sad song. <laughs> wow. Um. I'm going to tap into some of the questions that we've got. We've got a lot of questions so far, um, but this also taps into what you just said. Um, and this is a question for everyone. Uh, how do you deal with the homophobia, transphobia in your own communities? Um, and I think we're talking about um, uh, from a racial standpoint, it could be a ethnicity standpoint. It could be a regional standpoint, like me in Mississippi, you know, I, that's a whole shit show. Um, Michael, uh, talk a bit about how you're uh, navigating homophobia and transphobia in the black community. Yeah. Um, it's been interesting. I mean, the majority of my family has been really great. Um, mm -hmm. The majority of my friends have been really great, but my friends' friends, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're Unfortunately, there's like a lot of, on top of all the all the shit that the black community has to deal with, there's a lot of internal warfare that goes on, which is really common, unfortunately, in marginalized groups is like, like marginalization within the marginalized group. And yeah. because like, we're all so traumatized that mm -hmm. like, we trigger each other with different things. Anyway, mm -hmm. I, I think for me, it's been, uh, dealing with people that say like you're bi what does that even mean like you're gay or why don't you just choose one like you can't decide you're indecisive or like do you sleep with every person you meet you know all these like cliche things um and like I remember actually one time in college and this was before I was I was out to like my close friends but not really to that many people mm -hmm. um I was uh, going to school in Boston and we were at the Prudential Center, me and a couple friends, me and a friend and her friend. And we were getting some food and somehow like the talk of lesbians came up. And I remember when anything about queer people came up, I was like, oh yeah, like, what do I say? What do I, you know? Um, and something that he said, my friend's friend, he said, I think that lesbians are just women who have been let down by men. <laughs> He's right. Are you right? <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, like, how do I even? And in that moment, I felt so trapped because I'm like, how do I come to the defense of an entire group of people? One, to which I don't belong. Two, I don't want people to spread this bullshit. But at the same time, I don't want to reveal myself because if I come out too in support of them, then I'm going to show, you know, all these things. And uh, the, the guy who said that was black. And I remember just, freezing up and I literally left like I had to go home I told them I wasn't feeling good and went home because I couldn't handle the emotional weight of that and I think the benefit of being out now is that when somebody says something like that I can just look them dead in the eye and be like talk say more about that what do you mean exactly and like when people are forced to question things that they have the privilege to not have ever questioned before it really like makes them uncomfortable and I'm like the fact that you can have this thought and not have questioned it up until now is like the sign of your privilege. So like, I'm going to show it to you so that you become aware of it. What you choose to do at that point is up to you. But like, I'm going to at least let you know that like, yeah, I like dudes and I'm going to talk about it. And you know what I mean? Just like being like on it and trying not to back down. It's hard. It's a practice. I don't claim to be good at it all the time, but like just trying to be like honest about it. OK, um, what about anyone else? Like, Leah, what was it like for you? Um. Well, when I came out, um, and, and dealing with was, the, your own community, yeah, yeah, within my own community, that's uh, that's that's pretty simple. I was raised Italian Catholic, exactly, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the entire Catholic faith is based on one basic policy: uh, ignore it, and it will go away. So uh, when I came out to my parents, we did the whole thing, the screaming, the yelling that Italians do, screaming, yelling, throwing things. And a month later, they forgot about it. And we had to do the whole thing again. <laughs> so <laughs> it's been, you 
know, the acceptance took time. It, by uh, by the time I that I always felt sorry I was I was listening to somebody say, I think it was Theo. Hey, I'm getting married to a black guy. That's really funny. But here I came into being known internationally in 1993 when I was the first openly gay comic on television in America, but that mm -hmm. was also, that was the Arsenio Hall show. It was shown all over the world. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I was seen all over the world and my poor mother had to sit there. <laughs> wow. While they clocked, they actually timed it in the, in, uh, in uh, the advocate, Dave, in the advocate, they did an article that between my stand up and being on the couch, I was on the screen for nine and a half minutes. And I said the word dyke, fag or queer 47 times. <laughs> my poor parents had to sit there and go, oh, she said, it. oh, not again. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, I mean, that stuff, that stuff going on. But even today, I mean, it's still this stuff will happen. I was in the dog park of West Hollywood with a puppy and a bunch of friends. And I was wearing a t-shirt that said faggot. And uh, this guy on the bench looks at me and says, you shouldn't be wearing that t-shirt in this neighborhood. And I looked at him and I said, excuse me, sir, this is a gay pride t-shirt. And he goes, well, I don't think so. Not in this neighborhood. And I went, well, sir, this says faggot. It's a font and the title of the Larry Kramer book, Faggot, which came out in 1979, is considered one of the great pieces of <laughs> queer pride literature. So I think I'm wearing this in exactly the right neighborhood. And he goes, well, you know, well, that's not a very nice word and blah, 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 blah. And I went, look, you, you know, you're straight. You can't say faggot. I'm a faggot and I can say faggot. He goes, well, how am I supposed to know that you're straight? Think you're straight or not? Uh, well, I said, what are you, Ray Charles? By which I mean both blind and deaf? Because <laughs> <laughs> of course I'm, of course I'm a die. And then, you know, thank God for that moment because I actually got to do about 10 minutes of stand-up with everybody in the park laughing at this straight, straight guy telling me how to straight white man telling me how to deal with my oppression. You know, so it's like, I mean, that shit happens everywhere. And for me. Standing tall and facing it, I'm, this is all, this is my way. And I'm going to reiterate what somebody said before about closet shaming. People can only be where they are. So a lot of people can't do what I do. And I get that. I understand it. But I'm Sicilian and I am not going to fucking shut up. And I'm not going to take it from you. And I am encourage anybody else who has that kind of power in their life to go for it. You know, wow. look evil in the eye and call it fucking evil every fucking time. You know, wow. so I've got a combined following of over 2 million people in my social media and I get DMs every day, including today. A, a gay man was killed in Belgium three days ago and there's a big thing about it. And I've been contacted to post about it in my stories. Um, when when people contact me from Poland and, and, and saying they've just taken away a woman's right to choose. You're gonna get me on your side. I'm gonna use my, my media, I'm gonna do everything I can to make a change. Great. And that brings me to another question that uh, someone has uh, asked. Um, uh, briefly, could someone, you uh, answered us already, Leah. How, uh, how do you feel that social media and the internet, how it has impacted you personally uh, in the music industry as a whole? Uh, who wants to, uh, uh, let's hear from um, either Tova or Sara about uh, the impact of social media on your career and your personality, how you present yourself. Go, Sara. Ooh, well, that is a big question. Um, well, for me, I just always want to be as authentic as I can. And mm -hmm. I, I realize that social media is a huge, like, uh, tool to to express myself and also to be an example for people around the world as as there's people and so many many of them are are gay or, or lesbians and they they dm me about how i am giving them some support or courage or strength to be themselves and that is an amazing tool that we didn't have like even 10 years ago so it's definitely 
showing people more about you know about diversity and 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 that's amazing of course there's so many hmm, well also bad bad sides of social media and balancing like how to stay mentally healthy when using social media that can really mess up your your brain and your mind unfortunately so yeah but but i try to see the positive side and and that is definitely the the tool of of showing people that there are different kinds of people in the world and you can be yourself and just you know express yourself yeah mm -hmm. um, yeah double that it's so nice to be able to connect with people and especially when you have younger fans to just like be able to have that connection because then it doesn't matter what like I don't have any problems with like managers or la label people or like thinking stuff but if even if I had like if I had um it wouldn't matter because I have that direct access to my audience and so we can talk in peace about all the gay stuff mm -hmm. I'd like to add one thing uh too with last year with the election in the United States um that social and I, I've I've come to social media kicking and screaming. I thought it was going to go away. That didn't happen, but uh, I've sort of embraced it now and I understand it. But what I I'm offended by is, and it's not a big amount of people. It's a small amount of people, but they ruin it for the rest of us. Which is, if you ever want to, and I don't know if anybody anybody on the panel has experienced this like I have, but if you want to express yourself, other aspects of your personality on social media to your fans, uh, especially when it comes to politics. And we all know in the United States this last year has been a shit show mm -hmm. if you want to express yourself. Because um, I have a lot of, I'm a complete Democrat and I have a lot of Republican fans. I mean, <laughs> it's a lot. And I know they're there and um, you know, I try to be respectful. I don't try to, to uh, offend anybody, but if you want to just say, and I, I, the language is so carefully thought out, right? I'm trying specifically not to offend anybody. And even when I just put the slightest bit of, of who I am out there, people say, shut up, that's bullshit. We don't want to hear that from you. Just shut up and play the sax. That's really the message that it's coming to me. And I'm so offended by that. You know, so we actually, a group of, uh, of jazz artists, we went and we we put another Facebook uh, group out called, um, uh, it's called JTO, Jazz Takes On. So it was an opportunity for us to get off of our normal pages and have a page that we can go to and express ourselves politically, where you're, the, anybody that's there is there because they want to hear that from us. So it was kind of a weird thing to have to do that just to share other aspects of your personality online like that it's a very okay. compli it's a very complicated uh, dance because w what i feel gay liberation has been fighting for is to say what we want and to wear a t-shirt that says faggot on it and for you know for larry kramer to say whatever he wants to say and write and now what i'm feeling is there is the opposite is happening that the young generation is policing speech they're telling us what not to say and so it's becoming this very very careful eggshell dance that I am so sick and tired of. And I agree uh, with that. For me, my biggest problem right now is in the gay community or what gay community there is, I don't see a lot of co community. I see a lot of fragmentation, especially among the gays, who is prettier, who is richer, who is what, whatever. And I don't f feel a sense of community. I see it more with my lesbian friends um, and with my in the in the female community more than in the in the gay community. But the the word community to me is sort of very because of social media partially as well. Who has the most followers? Who has, you know, who is prettier? Who is more successful on that platform? That's sort of what we're racing after, and I don't get as much of a sense of community as I got 20 years ago before this all started. I, I would go back even further and just say this about that. And I, I can talk about the whole historical aspect in terms of the modern queer movement that happened. That's why I say queer. I don't do the LGBTQIA alphabet soup thing. The reason I don't is because that, I believe, points out our differences rather than our shared oppression. We're, if we want to be a queer community, instead of a bunch of factioned off individuals that don't trust each other, 
then we need to embrace who each other are. And when I speak at universities and perform at universities, we have, uh, we have open discussions afterwards. And I take this head on and I encourage everyone else to as well. If somebody says, some, if I sit, use a term or say something that offends you, I am not your enemy. So don't come at me as some kind of enemy. I'm not your enemy. In fact, you should get down on your hands and knees and kiss my fucking feet for what I've done to give you your right to bitch me. But, right. but, but if you talk to people within the community, again, I'm going to do that every time because Theo, you're right. It's not. But in the community, if we took a little bit of time and approached each other with love, we'd have a lot more time to point our fingers at the powers that be that are the reason we are repressed. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm so happy you said that, Theo. It's one of my biggest pet peeves. No, uh, Michael, uh, you want to say something briefly? We have to, we have to wrap up, but this is great conversation. Did you want to say? Yeah, something? I, ju I just wanted to say, like, I, I absolutely hear that. I think the main problem that I've seen, because I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, is just collective trauma. Like all of us are, are just traumatized. And when your trauma is triggered, the reactions that you do are disproportionate to the situation. And unfortunately, like those reactions, if they're directed at other people with similar trauma, it triggers them. And then you're just like in this like trigger shame storm that goes around and everybody feels attacked. Nobody feels heard. Everybody gets angrier and angrier and angrier. And like, you know, I think it's about making space at the table for everyone and acknowledging within yourself if you have already had made had space made for you and somebody else hasn't to acknowledge within yourself like I haven't made space for this person doesn't mean I'm a shitty person. It just means that I had the privilege of not being aware of them. So now I need to make space for them. And that means I have to go inside and do some self-examining and understand my internal biases. Like I was definitely transphobic without realizing it. And one of my best friends is trans and I didn't realize my own inner biases until we moved in together. Mm -hmm. And like now I've made, I mean, there's always more work to be done, but now I've definitely made space for trans people in my like worldview. But like, I think it's all about realizing that if you feel threatened by words that someone says, it's usually because of some trauma and we all just need to realize that rather than attack each other for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Uh, guys, um, this is the part in which I hate. It's like, I have to conclude this, even though we have tons of questions, which lets me know that this is a conversation. This could have been a retreat. This we should have been one for uh, the pandemic. We should have been at Leah's place in P Town, having a week long retreat and music and glitter and disco. And let's talk about that. <laughs> let's let's talk about it. Let's, so I wanna, let's make it happen. So I want to thank everyone. I definitely want to uh, thank um, Sonny Sumter from the DC Jazz Festival. Uh, the embassies of Finland and Sweden for allowing me, inviting me to host this. And I want to thank all the panelists, uh, Theo Blackman, uh, Tova uh, Stricker. I'm still trying to learn how to pronounce that correctly. <laughs> Michael Miguel, Dave Koz, Sara Alto, Leo Delara, and Andrew D'Angelo. And hopefully this is a luncheon pad for a much larger conversation, hopefully uh, post pandemic, we can actually do this live and hug each other and laugh and have some nice debauchery uh, <laughs> going on at the same time. But I want to thank everyone who tuned into this panel discussion, and I encourage all of y'all to check out everyone's music that's on this panel. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for having Bye. us. Bye. You. See you at the discotheque. I'll see you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, John. Thank you, John, for moderating a great session. I again want uh, to thank the embassies of Finland and Sweden for partnering with the DC Jazz Festival to present this very provocative discussion. And we hope that the dialogue continues. We uh, live, in a, live in a shared community here globally, and let's celebrate our diversity. Uh, and let's, as uh, one of the panelists, I believe Michael just said, let's find space for everyone. So long, everybody. Take really good care of each other, and we'll see you next time. Let's continue the dialogue. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.